Gabriela, would you like to start by introducing yourself, please? I am Gabriela Gonzalez. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at Louisiana State University and former spokesperson of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. As you said, like you're the former spokesperson of the LIGO um, project. So could you start off by telling us, well, by describing what is a gravitational wave? A gravitational wave, we like to say, are uh, ripples in space-time. <laughs> Einstein's theory, which is a theory of gravity, says that space-time is like a grid. Uh, we imagine a three-dimensional grid for space with clocks for space-time, but it's not rigid. It gets warped by masses. <laughs> And gravitational waves happen when masses wiggle around, they move around. If we have two masses or one mass is being excited, and then these ripples travel at the speed of light. Those are the gravitational waves. So can you give an example of the masses that might be causing the ripples? Well, uh, the prediction uh, that Einstein himself made in 1916 was that these gravitational waves were so weak that they would never be seen. The ones that we saw for the first time in 2015 were produced by two black holes that each had about 30 times the mass of our sun, but compacted in 300 kilometers each. <laughs> and they were in spiraling around each other at about half the speed of light before merging into a single black hole. So it took that huge event to produce gravitational waves that when, when they reached us were just tiny, tiny, tiny effect, but we could measure it. And how did you feel when the first gravitational wave got measured? Oh, we were so surprised. We were not expecting it at all. Nobody knew how many binary systems with black holes are out there. We knew that if they were out there, they would produce strong gravitational waves, but we had we only knew about we only knew about a few uh, black holes of solar masses uh, smaller than the ones at the center of the galaxies and we didn't have any evidence of a pair so we were expecting uh, to see with gravitation with uh, the gravitational wave detectors with the LIGO detectors we are targeting these to look at the merger of neutron stars <laughs> that produce weaker signals so we were not expecting to see any signal and just before we started taking data 24 hours a day this huge signal came to us huge to us of course it was tiny but <laughs> compared to our noise it was huge and we just didn't believe it. We, we thought it was a dream. We thought it was a test. <laughs> it took us a, at least a day to convince that this, is not, this was not at least an intentional test. <laughs> so, so now we've sort of gotten used to the idea that they are gravitational waves and that more and more will probably be detected. And people have compared these gravitational waves to, to having a new type of telescope almost to look at or to listen out in the universe. So what kind of events are you hoping to see? Like you said, I mean, we have detected now three uh, gravitational waves, all three from the merging of black holes. Not that far in astronomical terms, <laughs> but for us quite far away. Two of these systems were a billion light years away, another was two billion light years away. <laughs> Um, but we, uh, what we want to detect uh, is the merger of neutron stars. Black holes, the merger of black holes is not expected to produce any electromagnetic wave, but the merger of neutron stars or even a neutron star in a black hole is. So what we would love to see is a gravitational wave that comes from a signal that also produces electromagnetic waves, X-rays or gamma rays that are seen by telescopes. And then we like to say that we are looking and hearing such signals. So is it that essentially like, well, like what we have in real life, that if an event happens in front of you, you normally see it and you hear it. So would that be the equivalent that we can see it and that's see those events and hear them? That's right. And, and the signals are produced by different uh, features in the system. The gravitational waves are produced by the motion of the masses. The electromagnetic waves are produced by the electrons. So now you can tell what everything is doing in that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, what would we learn from detecting those 
are there, are there collision of neutron stars, collisions, coalescences of neutron stars? What, what would we learn from seeing and hearing and understanding that? Well, we would of course learn that these things uh, merge and perhaps produce black holes as we expect. <laughs> there are some theories that when they merge they produce some other strange stars. <laughs> so we would be able to tell whether that happens or not. Uh, we have several theories on how the, the, ma the matter inside of, of the neutron star is, uh, how it is arranged, what we call the question of state. And there are uh, several theories and there's almost no way to tell which one is true. But if we can see the merger with enough sensitivity, which is non-trivial, we would be able to tell the nuclear <laughs> matter inside the neutron stars. So it's like the story of science has always been. It's observation, observing events, comparing to theories, feeding into theories, and gaining a better understanding of everything. That's right. That happened with the black holes. We didn't know how many there are. Now we can count them. And there are many theories that have been ruled out about how they form. And now there are new theories about how, how they, they can form this numerous, <laughs> this number of binary black hole systems. And what about the wavelength of those gravitational waves? Um, are they the ones, well, the waves that we will be able to detect in the future, will they have an ever-increasing wavelength? or how Well, gravitational waves, just like electromagnetic waves, come in many different wavelengths. The, for example, even if we only talk about black holes, the wavelength of the gravitational wave depends on the mass of the black hole. So the larger the black holes, the longer the wavelength. We know that at the center of every galaxy, there are black holes that have millions, sometimes billions, of solar masses. <laughs> at the center of our galaxy, there's a small one that only has four million solar masses. <laughs> the collision of those would produce gravitational waves that are way, way lower than what we can detect with LIGO or with detectors similar, similar to LIGO. So there are space detectors. You can have three satellites in space a million kilometers away sending lasers to each other, bouncing on mirrors, and that would detect these gravitational waves. That project exists, it's called LISA. It has a launching date in a couple of decades from now, <laughs> in 2034. We hope it, it launches earlier. But that's not even the end. You can look at even more massive black holes or even rumbles of the early universe if you use the radio signals that we get from pulsars. In our galaxy, there are some st uh, stars, neutron stars, that we call pulsars because they emit beams that we receive on Earth as radio, with radio telescopes, and then from the pulsing that we observe, we can tell how fast the, st the star rotates, how far away it is, lots of different things. And if we use these radio beams from different pulsars in our galaxy, we can use that as an interferometer. <laughs> That's amazing. And that measures gravitational waves produced by these billion solar mass black holes, supermassive black holes, or by the early universe, which will, would produce gravitational waves that are at all wavelengths, but the lower the wavelength, the larger the amplitude. That would be amazing to detect gravitational waves from the beginning of the universe. <laughs> and that actually, the best bet for that, it's not this pulsar timing uh, that, that I'm talking about, although I don't discount that they will do it. <laughs> it's uh, measuring the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. We have now very, very fine measurements of the cosmic microwave background, which are these waves that come from the beginning, not quite the beginning of the universe, but the early universe. And it turns out that the gravitational waves that existed even before those waves were emitted would change the polarization of those photons. What so is the polarization of the photons? Right, the, the electromagnetic waves, are, we call them transverse waves because they travel in one direction and they have two polarizations. So the electric field can be in this direction or in this direction, and those are two polarizations. And um, in, if there are no gravitational waves in the early universe, the photons that we receive here on Earth, ideally, are not polarized. They don't prefer one direction to the other. 
but the gravitational waves would affect the direction of these electro electric and magnetic fields in a very particular pattern. <laughs> it would produce a pattern in the sky around the hot and the cold spots that we see in the microwave background, and we could recognize in there gravitational waves. It's like the handprint mm -hmm. <laughs> of gravitational waves. So in connection to that, if you think about the next kind of big breakthrough, maybe in physics as a whole, but or in particular this area concerning black holes and things, do you think that will happen primarily due to technological improvements or due to new mathematical ideas oh, they or all theoretical go. ideas? They all go together. <laughs> <laughs> ideas uh, turn into technology, technology turns into better instruments, better instruments turn into new ideas that motivate new, <laughs> new instruments that need better technology. It's all a circle it's a that goes down. That's right. Okay, thank you very much.